Tom Brown. I'm your host for today's Green TV. Sheila Provencher was a regular participant in Michiana Peace and Justice Coalition's weekly vigil at the Federal Building until she went to Iraq with Christian peacemaker teams. CPT is an ecumenical organization which places teams of trained peacemakers to work with local partners in situations of violent conflict around the world. In 2001, Sheila earned a Master of Divinity degree from the University of Notre Dame. During her time as a graduate student, she developed and later presented workshops to educate youth ministers about the struggles that gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transsexual teens face in the church. She has begun work on a book on the same topic. In the years before joining CPT, Sheila participated in a 28-day, water-only, fast for peace and nonviolence, traveled to pre-war Iraq with the Catholic delegation, and spoke out often to urge the U.S. to seek nonviolent solutions to the Iraq problem. Since summer 2003, Sheila has been a full-time member of CPT and has lived and worked in Iraq since December 2003. Highlights of her CPT work include monitoring the detainee system, accompanying families of detainees through the bureaucratic maze, and participating in CPT's Adopt a Detainee campaign. She helped develop and train brand new Muslim peacemaker teams and has accompanied them in actions aimed at bringing Shia and Sunni Muslims together. Sheila lives in an ordinary neighborhood in Baghdad a ministry of simple presence among neighbors. Here is part one of Sheila Provencher's talk, Come to the Table. Thank you all for coming. I think I was just reflecting that I honestly don't know if I would come to these things if I weren't presenting because I'm really serious because it's very difficult to voluntarily open yourselves to experience pain and suffering, which you're bound to do if you're going to think about Iraq. I mean, you could be home watching TV or walking along the river. So it's really, um, I'm very grateful that you're here and that we can experience this together. I tend to have a soft voice, and since there's no mic, just sort of raise your hand if you can't hear me. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay. Right, it's for the, the video camera there. Um, okay. The name of my organization is Christian Peacemaker Teams. What we do is technically called nonviolent third party intervention. And the way we practice is we send small teams of trained peacemakers by invitation into areas of armed conflict around the world. Right now, we work in um, along the Arizona Mexico border in Iraq, in Palestine, and in Colombia. And we have a lot of regional groups in the United States and Canada as well. There's some literature on the chairs over there if you're interested in reading about CPT. Our work really varies a lot according to what country we're in. In Iraq, we've been there since October 2002, since before the war began. And the work that I've primarily done uh, is post-war. We started out trying to alert the military and um, encourage them to clean up the unexploded ordinance that was literally lying all over everywhere and kids would pick it up and lose their hands and lives sometimes. 
Then we started getting involved in detention issues and worked with families of detainees and with former detainees. We still do that work. And then this last winter, we got into a new area, um, training the brand new Muslim peacemaker teams. Because people would say to us, OK, you're CPT, but we need MPT. So a group asked us to come and train them, which we did this winter, and we've done action together with Muslim peacemaker teams. So that's just sort of a brief overview of our work, and I'll give you lots more examples of the day-to-day -day work in, during the presentation. But I'll start with a story. Some of you may have heard this story before, if you've heard me speak before. There's lots of new stories, I'll promise, but some of them are sort of the old and good ones. So this is Saad, my Iraqi host father. I lived with an Iraqi family for six weeks when I first moved to Iraq full time in January 2004. He, this is his little boy, Mortada. And Saad told me a story um, once that I never forgot. When he was about Mortada's age, he said, when I was a little boy, I lived next to a church. And he's a good Muslim man, naturally. Well, one day, he said, I heard the sound of music and laughter coming from over the wall that surrounded the church. So I climbed up into a tree in my backyard to see better, see what was going on. And I fell out of the tree and landed in the middle of the courtyard in the middle of a Christian wedding party. <laughs> and he said, he visually did this. He said, I, I squinched my eyes tight shut because I was afraid that they would kill me. But they picked me up and dusted me off and laughed and helped me home. Well, that same week that Saad told me that story, I talked to Father Vincent, who's the Catholic priest at a parish just two blocks from the CPT apartment. He's a great man, gives wonderful homilies, is very open. But when I said to him, could we have a meeting with the mosque around the corner and just sort of get people together to share? His whole face changed. He said, oh, no. If we go to the mosque, they might kill us. And it was like an echo of what Saad had said his experience had been as a boy, just that fear to meet the other, to meet the person who's different from you and who might hurt you. I start with that story because fear is a daily reality in Iraq. And I experience it even when I'm going to drive in a car across the city. I honestly think in my mind when I'm going through Tahrir Square, where there have been four or five suicide bombs, Maybe this is the day that I'll suddenly blow up. And I, at the end of the day, I'm grateful to be alive. <coughs> Soldiers feel fear every day when they go out on patrol. They tell me. I listen to their stories, and they say, I don't know if I'm coming back every day when I go out. And Iraqis live in that fear day to day. Am I going to make it across the city alive? Will I be at a checkpoint and a, a frightened soldier accidentally shoots me? This um, friend of mine, Hin, I'm the one in the hijab, ironically. Um, I wear it now when I go out for uh, protection so that people won't automatically recognize me as a foreigner. Anyway, Hin, who's 26 years old, I'll never forget the way she put it. She said, I stopped going to college because I'm so afraid that as I travel across the city, something bad will happen to me. And maybe I'll lose my hands or my life. But even if I lost one finger, it would be too much to bear. And it's just this weight, the fear, every day. But when I come back to the US, there's still this sense of constant fear that we live under. And I experience it when I hear about the whole alert system. I don't read about it so much now, but we still have the yellow alert and orange alert. And we always hear about the war on terror and how people are out to get us. And we have to be prepared. We have to be ready. There's this sort of push to build new weapon systems and new ways of controlling our fear. This is a quote from the New York Times. Uh, General Lance Lord from the Air Force testified before Congress in the last month and said, we need new weapon systems, new security systems. We must establish and maintain space, superiori space superiority Simply put, it's the American way of fighting. Then he talked about this Air Force space program, nicknamed Rods from God, which will hurl cylinders of titanium or uranium 
from the edge of space to destroy targets on the ground with the force of a small nuclear weapon. So there's this sense of we have to be afraid and we have to prepare so that people won't hurt us. Well, like I said, in Iraq I'm afraid every day, and I'm going back in August, and so I'm trying to just keep mentally prepared that I will have to live in that fear again. So the fear is a reality, but what I've come to learn, mostly from my friends in Iraq, is that there's more than one way to respond to fear. One way is to try to be stronger than the one you're afraid of and control it or them and build more weapons and just be stronger. The other way is the way that I'm named this talk after, come to the table. It's to, as in a Christian sense, love your enemy. Come to the same table and see the fear as the enemy that you have to together work on. So basically, um, this talk will focus on that second option, the other path through fear. And that's what most of the stories will be about. So I'll tell you one that happened just about a month ago in Fallujah. As you know, Fallujah, there have been two military assaults. It was a center where there were a lot of insurgent activity and people involved in the violent resistance. So it was a target last April and then again in November 2004. And in the military assault, a lot, a lot of civilians were killed and suffered. In November 2004, about 60% of the homes were destroyed. Um, I traveled to Fallujah about a month ago with the new Muslim peacemaker teams. And I'm showing you the highway sign first because I'm going to start with the experience of fear. And on that highway, on the way to Fallujah, we were all really scared. Um, Muslim peace teams is right now made up all of Shia people. You know the difference? It's like Catholic, Protestant, Sunnah, and Shia Islam. Well, MPT was birthed in Karbala, Iraq, which is Shia. So here are all these Shia men and women on their way to Fallujah, which is a Sunnah city. And I said to my partners in the car, um, their names were Safa and Akil, and I said, uh, did you tell your family where you're going today? And Safa said, no way. <laughs> if I told my family, they'd tell me, oh, those Fallujians are terrorists. They're crazy. Don't go to Fallujah. So they said, um, I'm going to tell them when I come back. And I said, that's what I do with my mom, too. <laughs> but <laughs> um, so that was their perspective. And I was afraid, because I'm a US citizen. And I knew that the US military had done these two assaults on Fallujah. The stated reason was to break the backbone of the resistance. But the result was to really damage, uh, to kill a lot of civilians, and to spread the resistance off into Mosul. But here's some of the damage. So basically my fear, going back to being an American citizen, was these people will see me as the enemy. I could be allied with the occupation. I could be easily the enemy. Here's a mosque that was completely destroyed. This family, um, behind them is sort of the rubble that was their house. And you can see these ropes on the right side. Those are holding up a tent, which is where they now live, probably about the size of this area here, a whole family. This man standing in front of the rubble that was his daughter's home. This little boy picked up um, a cluster bomb on the ground and he lost some fingers. He was in the hospital the week uh, that it happened the week before I got there, which was in um, May. And so this, even though the assault was in November, th these types of injuries are still happening. Then this other little boy that I'll show you lost an eye, just so you know if you don't want to look. Um, his face is very beautiful, though, if you look very closely at it. And that happened in, during one of the assaults. At the time I took the picture, he was in a refugee camp. A lot of families fled to Baghdad or other areas and lived in tents. Okay, back to the highway sign here. So we're going along, and I'm thinking all these things and envisioning these pictures and thinking, these people could see me as the enemy. Well, what type of reception did we get? This is Sheikh uh, Abdul Hamid al Jumaili of the Al Furqan Mosque, and he welcomed us. Uh, we were there to try to help symbolically rebuild after these assaults and just to listen to people's stories. And he welcomed us. He didn't try to hide his frustration. In fact, his driver 
had been killed um, just four days before we got there, accidentally shot by a, a military convoy. But he welcomed us and spread this beautiful feast, and we all sat down and ate together. So this line from a psalm came back to me. God prepares a table before us in the presence, or God prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And that's from Psalm 23, that we probably all know it starts out, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So I'll read just that part of it, because it means something different to me now from when I was growing up. The part that I quoted is included in this half of the psalm. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Well, I grew up in a Catholic home, and when I heard those words, I always thought that it meant God prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy who has to stand over there and watch while I eat and go hungry because I win. God's on my side. I get the table. But I've lived in the Middle East now for a year and a half, and it is absolutely unthinkable to do that. If ever there's a table of food, you must invite everyone who's in the room. And the psalmist was from the Middle East. So this, this line now, God prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies, means to me that the invitation is to sit down at the table with the enemy and look each other in the eye and pass the butter and talk and listen. So it means something completely different, and that's actually why I choose the title of this talk, Come to the Table, because what happens? That's pretty radical. What happens around the table? Well, here's some ideas that I'll focus on. First, when you come without weapons, just as equals, you can experience the gift of ordinary life. And that's really the thing that keeps me going in Iraq, is the gift of ordinary life. Then, as you all know, you're, we're at least close to one other person in our lives, probably many. And when we're close to another person, we share in their suffering. And so if you come close enough to look in someone's eyes, you'll ultimately share in their suffering. So I'll tell you some stories about that. And then if there's not a power imbalance and we're really sitting at the table as equals, there's real trust and openness that can develop. And I've experienced that in Iraq. <coughs> and then all of the problems haven't gone away. There's still crises all over the world. But if we can sit down together, then all sorts of creative alternatives just blossom. So I'll tell you some stories about that towards the end. But first, the gift of ordinary life. I begin here because most of what I read in the news when I'm in the States about Iraq are just all the explosions every day. But it's a home to 26 million people who just happen to be born there. And I'm the lucky one who gets to share in these people's lives. This is my Iraqi family. I lived with them for six weeks and I still go to their house at least once a week and spend the night with them. Um, the kids, on this day, they were surprising their mom cooking dinner. Usually she does all the cooking. So they were really happy about that. Um, they fight, they argue over what channel to watch on TV, they haul their backpacks to school and stress out about their exams, just like kids here. It's regular, ordinary life. There's happy things um, in Iraq. This is a birthday party, and I'll show you a few more birthday parties, along with some singing. I hope you can hear it. I was at my party. Uh, these are some of my neighbors. Uh, on the left there is Sima. And the boys on the right, Allah and Omar. Um, I could say, Sima lives in a real shack, she and her mom. Uh, it's behind a very large house. I think it was originally servants' quarters. Mm -hmm. They don't have any generator, so they're completely on the city grid, which means they get about 10 hours, 12 hours of electricity per day. Um, just a little slice of their life. 
Here's more sounds. This is one of my favorite little kids laughing. She was trying to sing, but she kept laughing. Yeah. These gorgeous little girls are from Fallujah. And I include them specifically because uh, I know in my mind even Fallujah was, that's where the terrorists are. But Fallujah is home to 300,000 civilians. And these little girls are among them. This is an art festival that took place in my neighborhood about a year ago. Imad uh, plays violin at my church, and these little kids were just coloring. And here's some of their drawings. Real normal, happy looking thing. This is a real colorful one of different birds. But sharing ordinary life also means sharing things like this. This is also a child's drawing. It's of a tank attacking a moth. And then the sound that you'll hear is the sound of a mortar exploding about 100 yards from our apartment. I recorded it last August, actually. Yeah. The sounds like that are also part of the sounds of Iraq. This is um, one of the church explosions and the aftermath. And a neat story is that we went to see, two of my colleagues actually went to see if they could help at all. And when they were in the neighborhood of the church, a Muslim family came out of their courtyard and pulled them off the sidewalk into their house and said, it's not safe for you out there. Come in here and stay here until it's all passed. So our, fa our um, security really is in our friendships and our neighbors who do look out for us. The military presence is just constant. Um, you hear helicopter sounds, like that's what that is, that sound. Um, tanks and checkpoints everywhere in Baghdad. And right now, encircling Fallujah, since the November assault, there's been a real tight um, cordon around Fallujah, and you need a pass that says that you're Fallujah in order to get in and out of the city. That sounds reasonable enough. It, it keeps people, unwanted folks, from getting in and out, but it shuts down trade. And so the economy in Fallujah has just plunged. <clears throat> and it means that ordinary families can't even visit each other. If I live in Baghdad and you're my mom and dad who live in Fallujah, I can't visit you. And that's um, since November. Ordinary life is full of contrasts then. So here's Huda. She's the one who's laughing so hard she couldn't sing. And that poster is designed for children. It's got no words in it, but it's a man looking alarmed at some unexploded ordnance on the ground. So it's telling children not to pick it up. So those are the dangers that little Huda faces every day. There's things of beauty, like this sunflower. I took a picture of it. It was in Sima's backyard. And then there's rubble everywhere and trash everywhere. And the infrastructure, after two, more than two years, is still in tatters. Like I said, 10 to 12 hours of electricity per day in Baghdad. Um, right before I left in May, Ma Amira, my Iraqi host mother, warned me not to drink the water because it had cholera in it. It had been in the newspapers. And um, when I was in Senator Luger's office in Washington, D.C. last week, his aide showed me a chart. And it said that of all the money that was supposed to go to cleaning up the water systems, 7.5% of it had actually been dispersed. I don't know why it's getting held up, but this is a, a you know, the senator's aide is showing me this. It's, I'm sure it's a true statistic. Um, why would he, I mean, it doesn't look good, <laughs> so why would he lie about that? Um, anyway, it's uh, really, it's a very difficult daily life, especially now in the summer when it's so hot. Um, if there's no electricity, it means no fans, no air conditioning, and people really suffer. This is little Hussein, my buddy who lives in an abandoned building with his dad. And he drew me this picture of the Tigris River that's right across the street. So it looks really great. There's ducks and fish and birds. But this is what he really sees. There's razor wire everywhere and trash. Or just the river is, is um, heavily militarized on the other side. That's where the green zone is. More contrast. This is a toy store in my neighborhood, but a few blocks away there's a homeless family. That they, the store that they live in was abandoned because it was bombed during the shock and awe bombing. 
But there's a story that goes along with them, too. <coughs> this is Fatima. She didn't make it into this picture, so I inserted her. She's the eldest child of the family and sort of the ringleader of all their escapades. Um, so this is a story about the other path through fear and the gift of ordinary life. About two months ago, six weeks ago, one of my colleagues was threatened. His name turned up on a hit list. The terrorist group wanted to kidnap him. And some, his embassy found out somehow and warned him. He was a British citizen. It was right before the, the elections in Britain, and so a sort of prime target. So he left Iraq. But I was really scared that week. And I thought, what if they traced him to our apartment? And I was just scared. Well, one day I was, uh, during that time, I was walking down the street. I was just going to the market to buy a fish for supper. And people seemed less friendly to me. And I don't know if I was just projecting that from my fear, but it just added to the weight. So I was trying to buy this fish and afraid. And all of a sudden I heard, Sheila, 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 these little voices. And these kids came hurtling down the street and tackled me with hugs. And we were looking at the fish. It's a tub of live fish on the sidewalk. So you pick out the one you want. And so that distracted me. And then when I was trying to buy it, the man didn't want to let me pay because he'd seen me with the kids. And my fear was gone like that, dispelled by the gift of ordinary life with these little kids. Thank <laughs> you.